I, I did say once that the internet is not doing well. And if I had to guess when I said that, I would say that might have been 2010 or so, because I think now it's probably more accurate to say the internet is kind of a dumpster fire, right? The internet has been doing very, very, very poorly um, for a number of years now. And we're starting to learn more about the harms that the internet is causing um, to society. And there's a lot that we don't know um, about the ways in which the internet is causing various kinds of problems for us. I lived through all of this, right? I started working on the internet in um, 1999. I was working at CBC. I think I was in television at the time. And I switched over to the digital division, the digital department in about 1999. <clears throat> and back then, uh, we all, everybody who was doing stuff, we all felt like there was this tremendous promise, right? And when I look back now, it's really easy to see how intensely and embarrassingly naive we were, right? But we really did believe that it was gonna usher in a revolution of access to information and freedom of expression and people would be able to reach across borders and across time zones and learn new languages and make new friends in other countries. And just, we felt that it would be <clears throat> like amazing for democracy and for civic engagement and that it would just be transformative. Um, and what I started to realize over time was number one, that is a function of who are the people who are the pioneers in the super, super early days, right? So those are like visionaries and cranks and altruists and weirdos and, and they're high minded. And later the money people come and everything changes, right? And I realized that, I mean, part of what helped me realize that was another Canadian, Tim Wu, um, who used to be at Columbia, now he's in antitrust with Joe Biden's administration, um, wrote a book called The Master Switch, I think in 2010. And what he did in that book was he traced the development of communication revolution, technological communications revolutions, and how they play out in practice. And the story is always the same <clears throat> in radio, in film, uh, I think even the history of the telephone and now the internet, what always happens is the same. You start off visionaries, dreamers, blue sky thinkers. They think that it is going to be chess clubs and language lessons and poetry and high minded and awesome. And it is in the beginning. Right. And then as time passes, people see an opportunity to make money from it. That's what I experienced when I was in San Francisco. I moved there, I think in 2007. And when I moved there, Everybody I met was talking as though they were a bunch of sort of cyber hippies, right? Stuart Brand and The Well and all that sort of stuff. And it was like, oh my God, you know, we're changing the world. We're so awesome. It's so great. And I was struck by this disconnect because I would be in line at a sandwich shop or getting a coffee or whatever. And what I heard real people talking about on the ground all the time was like their IPO and their stock options. And I was like, this doesn't make sense. Like all this high minded conversation. But the reality was essentially Wall Street had come to the Bay Area by then. So people were still talking the way they used to talk. But the reality on the ground was really different. And you were starting to see people come in whose only goal was to make like a ton of money, right? Not that there's anything necessarily tremendously wrong with that, but that was crowding out all the dreamers and fantasists and idealistic people and so forth, right? So that's what started to happen. And then for a long time, we told ourselves myths about startup culture and moving fast and breaking things. And we were reimagining everything. We were reimagining work. We were reimagining life and blah, blah, blah. It was all, again, high-minded. Um, and then it all consolidated. And then it was like 10 companies, right? Like 10 mega companies all over the world, not paying their taxes and making a ton of money. And that's what it is today, right? So it's kind of baked now. It wasn't baked. There was a long period in which it could theoretically have become anything, theoretically, although Tim Wu's history tells us it doesn't, right? It took the normal path. The normal path is people looked, they saw Greenfield, a place where they could make a lot of money by constructing things in particular ways, you know, like making up a business model. We didn't used to have a business model on the internet. There was no business model until I don't know, the middle 2000s, right? Now the business model is super clear, surveillance capitalism, <laughs> right? It's all baked. And so now we're in a situation where we have a very small number of companies 
all headquartered in Silicon Valley, all operating globally, all externalizing all of their harms, right? So somebody else has to clean up the mess or the mess doesn't get cleaned up, right? It's not getting cleaned up right now. Like there's all kinds of danger and risk all over the place, right? Um, and it's baked. That's the world that we're living in now. So it's just different, right? It's not what it started off as. We probably, if we'd been better students of history, we would have known to expect exactly what happened, right? But we didn't know. And now here we are. This is where we are in the, in the cycle. Canada <clears throat> has to do some work to regain healthy in public discourse, right? I mean, I was struck in this election campaign that just passed um, when folks threw rocks or gravel, right, at the prime minister. I think we were all struck by that, right? You don't have to be a member of the Liberal Party. You don't have to be a fan of the prime minister to not want <clears throat> him to be thrown rocks at, right? Like you want in a democracy, the most fundamental important thing is that people can campaign and they can tell each other about their ideas and they can go out and speak to the public. So that was like not a good moment for us, right? Um, and we've been seeing the degradation in the discourse for a while. Women especially, and lots and lots and lots of studies have been done on this, right? Women getting rape th threats, death threats, getting pushed out of the public space, right? I saw an article, it was an old article, but I was getting ready for a talk that I was giving the other day. And I found this article that was titled um, Women, it was from maybe 10 years ago, and it was Women Authors Are Retiring From Writing Books Because of the Online Abuse They're Experiencing. And I thought, ooh, like I missed that, right? I missed that apparently a wave of like middle-aged women novelists just stopped writing because they were getting so hassled on the internet. We've become inured to it, right? It doesn't even surprise us anymore. It's, it's, the, it's the air we breathe, right? It's the soup we swim in. So, you know, what's been happening in the United States, which has been terrifying, clearly, everybody acknowledges that, right? I think what Canada sometimes doesn't acknowledge is that the same thing is happening here, right? There are studies that say that Canadians are um, more racist, more toxic online than other countries. We know that Canada has produced a lot of, um, the sort of preeminent is a funny word to use, but the most known um, public toxic white supremacist figures, right? We're not I worry about Canada because I feel like Canada has a bunch of comforting myths that it tells itself, right? And it is because we are next door to the United States. So it's always easy to point the finger over there and say, oh, you know, with their gun, their, their school shootings and their, all their violence and so much more racism and et cetera, right? Um, because they are so, it's such a violent and extreme country we can kind of be confident that we're calmer and more peaceful and more gentle and more inclusive, right? But we're comparing ourselves to the United States, <laughs> right? Like it's a false comfort, right? And I lived somewhere else for a long time, right? I lived in the United States for 15 years and I used to come back and I felt like I could feel as the internet became more widely used, right? And borders kind of dissolved. I felt like I could feel a tonal shift in the Canadian discourse, the way people talk to each other, the way they talked about their politicians, right? It, it took a shift. And I don't think people in Canada necessarily know it for a whole bunch of different reasons, right? Like you're a frog and the water is getting a little warmer all the time, so you don't notice. Also because of our comforting myths about ourselves relative to the United States. Also because everyone sees what happens near them and they think it's only near them. They don't realize maybe that it's happening more broadly. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of work to be done in this country. I worry that we tend to be a little mild. We tend to be a little complacent, right? And I think it's dangerous. This is a dangerous time for complacency. I ran the Wikimedia Foundation, which is the 501c3, so U.S. nonprofit, um, that operates Wikipedia for, I think, about seven years. Um, when I started there, they were located in Clearwater in Florida because that's where Jimmy Wales, the founder, was living at the time. And when I joined, the first thing I did was move them to San Francisco, right, because we needed to be able to grow and attract a bunch of tech talent, and that was just the place to do that. And so that was my introduction uh, to San Francisco, to Silicon Valley, to the Bay Area culture, 
Um, and the first thing that struck me when I got there was that there were no women anywhere. <laughs> it was really strange. And, and it took me a long time. I did a lot of reading and research and thinking about it because it was so striking. It was just really striking. I mean, I came from Canada and I came from media, which is relatively gender balanced, right? And getting increasingly um, more women over time as it becomes less high status and high, highly paid. <laughs> so, um, so that's where I came from, right? Um, and I got to the Bay Area and there were just no women anywhere and I couldn't figure it out. And I eventually realized that it wasn't so much a lack of women, although that was true. It was just an extremely narrow monoculture in a whole bunch of ways, right? Um, from a gender perspective, clearly. From an age perspective, though, too, it was a very young culture. Um, I had a friend who turned 50 while I was living there. Um, and he was advised by his PR manager to dress differently to offset the tragedy of being 50 in Silicon Valley. Um, and it was a very white culture, white and Asian culture, very few black and brown people um, in the Bay Area. And that, I think, is actually the root of the problem, right? Um, super privileged people. Uh, I think it was John Doerr. There was a venture capitalist who once had a kind of famous quote where he talked about um, what he looked for when he was making his investments. And he said, I look for Mark Zuckerberg, right? I look for young dude, you know, white guy dropout from an Ivy League college in the United States. And that was the template. And he was the one, he got in trouble for saying it. But the only thing different about him was that he said it, right? Like everybody was typecast, everybody was casting for that role, right? Um, and the problem with that is, like we all know, right, that like diversity makes you stronger and better and smarter because it's more viewpoints, it's more positions, it's more perspectives, it's more experiences, right? Like Wikipedia is a beautiful example of that, right? Like it's this enormous thing with way more variety than any newsroom and that's why it's so complete, right? That's why it, it contains as much stuff as it contains because something is interesting to everybody but you have to have everybody to get all that stuff. Um, and in Silicon Valley, such a monoculture, everybody very the same and politically the same too, right? Like, like this sort of streak of cyber libertarianism, right? Unchallenged, very much, you know, the, the sort of dominant view. And I think that that is what has led to a lot of the problems with how things have played out, right? Because like the defining characteristic of Silicon Valley is hubris, right? And hubris is like a, a young man's conceit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like an older man is going to is gonna have learned some lessons and had some tough experiences, right? And a woman is going to be trained to never be hubristic. She's not, she was never allowed to be hubristic, right? And lots of people are not allowed to be hubristic, but the people who are allowed to be hubristic are the dropouts of Ivy League colleges in the United States, right? So the whole, you know, Facebook, move fast and break things, like all of those mottos and all of those, that hubristic, like we're just gonna go out and do this and like, who knows what'll happen? Who cares? Doesn't even matter, right? Like, well, someone else will clean it up, right? Um, that was something that I think, I think grew directly out of that, right? And I think it continues, um, you know, some efforts have been made, right? And, and this much progress has been made um, in making it a more, somewhat more diverse environment. But I think those origins stay with it, right? Um, and I also think that um, the the fruits of that continue to play out today because that's what was modeled, right? And a thing that I think a lot about is like who gets to speak, right? I think about these debates that we're having now about harms and it is in some ways surprising that it's taken so long for us to start having those conversations, right? It was visible a long time ago, but it was not on the public agenda. It was not something that was discussed a lot. You know, c different countries have been taking action recently, right? But it took a long time. And I think that that is in part because who got to speak was folks who were closest to that culture, right? And so we weren't hearing from <clears throat> mothers, right? Black people, um, poor people, people who are sort of, you know, unbanked in the United States, like all sorts of things, right? Like I think sometimes about Twitter, when Twitter started its blue check program or whatever, right? I was talking with um, one of the Twitter founders about it years and years afterwards, and I was kind of like, 
that's kind of a weird thing to do, right? I don't even know why I said this, but I said, you know, that was kind of a weird thing to do because, you know, obviously you guys are what you are and it filters out from you. And so all these men who went to Ivy League schools, um, you know, kind of get the blue check and it sort of disadvantages all these other people who are equally capable, but just further removed their seven degrees of separation instead of one or whatever. And he had never thought about that. It had never crossed his mind, right? And so it's that narrowness, right, that you only have that one viewpoint at the table and everybody at the table thinks the same thing and sees the same, anticipates the same problems, but also has the same blind spots and does not anticipate whole swaths of problems. It's just like, oh my God, right? Um, and I think that's how we got to where we are. I was like, I was struck by it absolutely constantly when I was there. Like, like I would be in room after room after room and the only woman um, and it, it was just, it was, it was unmissable, right? The narrowness of that. And I do think it's a big part of how we've gotten to where we are now. When I talk about access, I, um, I talk a lot about access to information, right? Which is sort of predicated on or assumes access to the internet, which like God help us, right? Like I moved back to Canada um, about five months ago um, and I'm an hour from the nation's capital and my internet was such garbage. <laughs> and I was just like, wow, it is 2021. Like, oh my God, right? Like, like, and to be fair, that the same thing is true through huge parts of the United States, right? Like I was living in San Francisco and New York, so that's different, right? But yeah, so you start with access to the internet, um, but also access to information, freedom from censorship, all of that. But also um, what Wikipedia changed, what the internet has changed is everybody has a printing press now, right? So access to me, access to information includes information from other people, which therefore includes the right to speak as well, right? So it's all of that stuff. Um, and I think uh, that we need, we want, we should um, be updating a lot of our thinking about this stuff because I think, and you always sound like an idiot when you talk about this stuff because it's emergent, right? So you always sound clumsy and cartoonish, right? But I feel like arguably in the 20th century, arguably, <laughs> Um, there was a scarcity of information, right? And so the trick was to get information and folks were trying to choke off your ability to get information in a variety of ways or it was expensive or whatever, right? It was hard to get access to information. Um, I feel like in the 21st century, the challenge is different, right? In the 21st century, in the Western and developed countries and liberal democracies, there's a glut, there's a fire hose of information. And the question is more related to information quality and more related to getting stuff that is useful to you and helpful to you, right? Because the internet is, of course, full of junk and also full of misinformation and disinformation, right? So it's more of a quality question. But the other piece that I think we need to update our thinking on is the piece about um, speech, right? So, you know, a lot of the criticism of our government here planning on online harms, the online harms framework, a lot of the criticism is coming from the perspective of freedom of expression, right? That it ought not be curtailed. I have a bunch of quarrels with how people are talking about that, but I think the most important quarrel I have with it is that somebody's speech, we now know, somebody's speech is always getting silenced, right? It's really a question of who's getting silenced, right? And what we've seen with the way the internet has developed, like I'm not on the internet, right? Like I have a Twitter account. Do I tweet? Never, right? I used to tweet back when Twitter was like a little smaller and a little friendlier. And like, I just, I, I have, I don't like the performative nature of a lot of that stuff. It makes my skin crawl. So that's a piece of it. But I also think like, you know, the cost of speech is abuse and harassment, right? Um, for lots of different kinds of people. And so if you allow speech to be entirely unconstrained, you're gonna drive out the speech of major, sorry, minority, stigmatized, vulnerable in various ways, precarious, whatever. You're gonna drive out a bunch of kinds of speech. And I think we have so seen that to the point that now it's like, it's exciting and interesting when someone from a marginalized identity group dares to speak and sort of like owns it and is just like out there doing battle, like Mary Beard, right? The historian, like she's just out there, you know, like come at me, right? But you have to be a kind of pugnacious kind of person. Lots of people aren't like that, don't want to be like that, shouldn't have to be like that. We've got women 
um, you know, forced into private Facebook groups and forced out of public discourse, that's terrible, right? It's terrible. And it's invisible to us. And it's bad that it's invisible because it's a serious problem, right? So when I'm talking about access, I'm talking about all of that stuff, right? And I'm very much uh, like a high concern for me right now is that I think that there are many identity groups that are being forced into private spaces and aren't taking up space in the public discourse. And I think that's really dangerous because the public discourse is only as good as the quality of voices contributing to it. And if we're missing huge slices of people, and also if we're allowing in toxicity that debases, right? Like that's not healthy, that's not good for us. I think that activism is a really interesting word because I think that activism is a word that we use when we want to devalue something, right? And so in, in journalism, for example, right, we, we always had an aspiration to objectivity. Um, and we know now, right, because of George Floyd Summer, honestly, we know now um, that um, that has put people from marginalized identities into a box, right? It's been used to sort of um, put them in a box. And so they couldn't and haven't been able to bring their whole selves to work, right? Because they've had to park, right? Like what's that, there's a quote, you can't be neutral on a moving train, right? So if you're operating in a society that is unjust, even if it's trying to be more just, right? But it is currently unjust, pure, objective, neutral journalism, right, um, leads you to a place where you come, I think, uncomfortably close to stenography to power, right? Um, you have to be able to be frank. You have to be able to speak the truth, right? So I think that, I don't know, I think that objectivity and neutrality um, support power. They support power structures. Um, and that's why we label things that threaten power structures as activism. It's a way of defanging it. It's a way of um, robbing it of its strength by characterizing it. I'm not sure my wording is not exactly right, but like by characterizing it as opinion or, you know, your wild take. You have your own axe to grind or whatever, right? Um, so I'm not sure I really believe in it. I don't think anybody believes in objectivity anymore, really, right? Like, I think we've come a long way in that regard. And I think, you know, journalists are providing a lot more transparency in their work now and sort of owning up to their beliefs more than they used to. You know, organizations like Slate Magazine have been publishing how they vote. Their, their journalists say how they vote every election, which I think is welcome because we know they vote, except for those very old journalists who as a matter of principle, do not vote, which is very strange. <laughs> but we know that they vote, right? And so it's it's only more useful to people. Like we're all we're all coming from the view from where we sit, right? And so ponying up to what that view is just seems like that can only help, right? It can only help for transparency and understanding, I think. I mean, I think there is such a need um, for people to go into the space, right? I really feel like the, the space cannot be left to the technologists, right? They can't govern themselves, they can't constrain themselves, and those businesses can't constrain themselves, right? And, you know, there's this sort of mythology that um, people who work in policy, people who work in government, um, regulators, are clueless about the internet, that they're Luddites. And I think that that is the single smartest thing that Silicon Valley ever did was sort of level set there, right? That if you raise a question or you have a concern or you have a criticism, you are a thousand years old and don't know how to use your laptop, right? Um, because it's really smart, right? Because in truth, there's lots to know about the internet. Nobody knows everything. Like nobody is an expert in AI and algorithms and security and infrastructure. Like it, it, it's ridiculous, right? Um, and so anybody can be tagged with the concept of like, you don't know anything, you're a Luddite, right? Um, and so I think the brave thing to do <laughs> if you're a young person is to wade in to this messy emergent space where like, you're not gonna know a lot of stuff. There's gonna be lots of things you don't know, right? But to trust yourself and your role, like if you go into policy work, right? 
we need people, I think, we need people um, doing policy work who understand the landscape and who are firmly committed to being on the side of the public, right? Because the public's interest needs to be represented. It's like, I think I'm, I'm old school, right? Like, I think it's honorable work. <laughs> I think it's very important work, right? I think working for the public on behalf of the public is the most important, the best thing that you can do. Not everyone feels that way. That's how I feel. Um, and so I think there's just so much scope. There's so much terrain. There's so much to be learned. There's so much to be done. You know, we've only just started this kind of thing. Um, we're not doing a good job of it yet, right? We're going to make everybody, we're going to make a million mistakes, a million embarrassing mistakes. You already see it, right? Facebook's threatening to pull out of Australia, right? Like I think Google did, I don't know, right? Like it's all a big mess. It's all very embarrassing. Like everyone looks like an idiot sometimes on the public stage. It's like awful, right? But I think overcoming that discomfort, right, is part of the process. Like it's going to be a mess until it's not a mess, to get it to not be a mess is going to mean a bunch of iterative work, right? And learning as you go and figuring things out. Like stuff doesn't get built instantly, right? But there's nothing, I don't know. I mean, I think there's nothing more important that a young person who wants to do public service work could do, right? Like this is the burning fire that needs a thousand hours of 10,000, a hundred thousand, whatever hours of energy invested in working it through, right? Nobody has the answer. So if you want to make a difference, it's a place where you could make a difference because the answers aren't known, right? You're not walking a well-paved road, you're blazing a path, right? So I think that's compelling, I hope. It's a funny thing, right? The privacy people of whom I count myself one never made a good case. We never made a successful case, right? We never persuaded anyone to care about privacy. Like it was really interesting. Like all the research, all the practice, people will not pay a dollar for privacy. They will not pay 10 cents for privacy, right? They just won't because they don't, I think they don't see the harms as outweighing the advantages. And I think what we're beginning to understand, I think, I think, is that the, the downsides of lack of privacy don't accrue to the individual, they accrue to the society. That's the thing we misunderstood. I think we thought, like we thought, oh, you know, a spammer will spam me. And it's like, yes, right? And that is sort of taken care of. And with, oh, identity theft, and that's not really a thing, right, really. Um, and we thought it would be that kind of thing that like, remember all the stories of like, the young girl who found out she was pregnant and her dad found out because they mailed a package to her house because they predicted her pregnancy or whatever, right? We thought it was going to be that kind of thing, like, oh, you know, my life directly impacted in a terrible way because of this. Um, and it turns out it's not so much that. It's subtler than that. It's ways in which we change our behavior because we don't have an expectation of privacy. So we're more guarded. And it's what happens to young people when they're out there in public and the performative nature of things is because in part because of that expectation and the societal stuff like the fact that in aggregate we are tracked is the actual problem and all the machinery of targeting us and inciting us and making us excited and always on tenterhooks like in service of a privacy invasive um, infrastructure right the harms are not what we expected them to be so we never did so nobody cares right I was um, for whatever reason a couple of years ago I was interacting with a bunch of, I think they were high school students or like maybe just first year university students and they could have cared less. Like I was like proselytizing them and they're like, we don't care. And they did not understand how any of this stuff got made, which I found fascinating. One of the kids I was talking to thought that Facebook was a product of the Canadian government. I think because it's sort of utility-like, right? And I think they just thought, oh yeah, you know. And I was like, no, it's made by a guy in California. And they were like, what? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And they, I tried, I was just curious. I was really curious. So I was asking them a lot of questions about like how they use their devices and stuff. And they had zero critical distance from any of it. They gave no thought to like, what might happen to their information? Who else might have it? What might they do with it? Zero thought to that. And I'm a, two minds about that like 90% I'm like oh my god that's really bad and then 10% I'm like maybe that's where it's going and we're all gonna have to just adapt and maybe it's fine I don't know right but but it it's like really it's very different right it's very different they yeah 
yeah, I was not sure what to make of it. I'm still not sure. So we can't protect our digital selves. I mean, that's the problem, right? Like we can't. Um, and this is what I found so interesting in the discourse on this stuff in the United States, because the United States is such an individualistic culture that people look for individual solutions. And it's, it's similar to the privacy debate, right? There was a period in the privacy debate when people were saying, you should get paid for your data. And that was like so hilarious to me. It was like, what? Like you're gonna give me 18 cents for selling my information to a data broker? Like that's ridiculous, right? Like that's not the nature of this problem, right? None of this stuff is individual stuff, right? So we can't protect ourselves. Nobody ever reads the terms of service anywhere. Nobody ever changes the defaults on anything, right? It doesn't matter what kind of labels or warnings or notifications get put on something. It does zero good. Like I think there was some there was some work done on the notifications that Twitter was putting on um, Donald Trump's tweets for a while. And I think what the research found was it had the opposite effect. It actually amplified them. So none of that stuff works, right? Digital literacy is probably worth some investment of time. We know that the oldest people are the most illiterate, right? Like they're the most credulous because they came up in a world where you could be credulous because stuff was vetted and if it got to you, it was probably true. And they're, they haven't realized that that's not the case anymore. Um, but some level of digital literacy, like how stuff gets made, probably makes some kind of sense, right? And so that's a good thing that people could do is like read up or whatever. But it's not reasonable to expect people to protect themselves. And I think it's it's a con, right, to expect them to protect themselves because that is what government is for, right? Like I can't go to the car dealership and buy a car that's going to explode and kill me. I can't buy a refrigerator that's going to burn down my house, right? Like that's not okay. We've decided as a society that's not, it's not acceptable. Like I shouldn't have to have that level of vigilance in the world that I'm constantly, you know, like acting as though everything is trying to kill me. People should be reasonably safe, right? Um, and that needs to be true for the internet as well. I mean, <clears throat> that's what, like I, I'm on the board of the Canadian Anti-Hate Network who track extremism. Um, in this country. And I joined their board when I was still living in the United States because I was so interested to know what was going on in Canada. And I knew they knew. So I wanted to be on their board so I could kind of like soak that up. And it was fascinating because when I joined their board, one of the things that I did to kind of prepare was I did a little wandering around in the world of, of the hate extremist people. Um, and it's easy to find that stuff. I watched hours and hours of YouTube videos of some white supremacist dude somewhere out west in his basement with confederate flags <laughs> in alberta <laughs> um and he's just vitriol and all the comparisons to animals like all the horrible sewage that like sh if you want it and you're gonna seek it out and you're very very motivated like we can't eliminate it from the world but the idea that it's possible for somebody to kind of like randomly stumble upon it or worse, get it served up to them on purpose by the YouTube algorithm. I mean, that's terrible, right? So it's not, I don't really like the word safe because to me safe sounds like it, it has connotations of like nanny state and paternalism and stuff like that. But things need to be some level of safe. <laughs> they do, right? Like we don't want to live in a society where stuff is blowing up and killing us in a everyday fashion, right? Um, and so the solutions aren't individual. That was a very long answer to your question, but the answer is the solutions are not individual. It's completely unreasonable. Why should people have to spend four hours a day, every day, battening down the hatches so terrible things don't happen to them and their children and their dad and like whatever? Like it's outrageous, right? It needs to be constrained um, to the point where people can function and use the internet for all the wonderful things that the internet is great at, right? Get all the benefits of it without accidentally stumbling across horrific stuff that shouldn't be promulgated to ordinary people who aren't even looking for it. I gave a talk once, um, maybe 10 years ago, and this woman came up to me after the talk and essentially what she said to me, she was like a totally ordinary middle-class lady 
And essentially what she said to me was her, her son, who was 18, had turned into a misogynist creep because of the internet. I had never, at that time, I had never heard of such a thing. Like it was before we knew about incels. It was even before Gamergate. It was before all that stuff, pickup artists, like all of that. None of that was known, right? And she was very embarrassed because she was like, we raised our kid to be great. And he was great for like ever. And then something happened. And she's like, he's spending a lot of time playing video games. I don't know if that's what it is. And then later we found out like white supremacists are recruiting in video game chat rooms, right? So like, like... It isn't safe right now. There is no answer, right? Like, I don't think you can be off the internet if you're 15. Like, how could you, right? You can't be off the internet as an adult, right? Like, you have to be on LinkedIn. It's weird if you're not, if you don't have some kind of presence, right? So there's no way to be thorough and like in the woods and not touch any of this stuff. And there's no way to be safe while being immersed in it. And there's not really any kind of middle ground. I mean, I do find it fascinating that in Silicon Valley, it's, very common for people to have their children not using screens, right? Like it's like, oh, <laughs> note to self, right? Um, so, but 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 no, there is no middle ground. There is no there is no right answer. I mean, that's one of the things that I think it's really important. I think that people understand that is that it's not their fault, right? They're not doing anything wrong. Like there is no answer. There's no magic button where like I do these settings and whatever, and then it's fine, right? Like it's a mess, it's a disaster, it's a tire fire, right? Um, and the answer is the long, slow plodding of government groping towards solutions, making things slightly better all the time. That's the answer. I think that's the only answer we have. That's the only answer we've ever had to this kind of thing. I so wish <laughs> that I had a good answer <laughs> to the question of what policymakers should do. Like, I so wish, right? I do not know. And I don't think anybody knows, like, for real, right? Like, we do not know what the answers are. I think that there's an emerging, there's beginning to be an emerging consensus that the solutions lie at the business model and algorithm level, right? Um, a challenging thing about the proposal that the government has put forward so far is that it tends to, I think, um, focus again at the individual level, right? Like I make a complaint to somebody, I go to a new tribunal of some kind for justice to get the takedown when it was denied to me, that kind of thing. Um, and I think that that is in, it's an important step because that when somebody is harmed, like they are really harmed and they need some avenue to recourse, right? But it's not the full answer. I think, I think, I think we are starting to understand that it's systems, right? It's like the business model of the internet requires um, the, the amplification of inflammatory material to keep people attached to their devices so they can be served ads. Like it's that simple. And so the solutions need to be somewhere at that level, right? And the theory, I think, is that the, the, the negative externalities created by those companies, they need to pay the costs of either not creating those externalities or of fixing them, like solving them, band-aiding, whatever, right? Um, so I think that's the principle level thing. But as a practical matter, like we have no idea. We know nothing, right? We know nothing about how the algorithm rhythms work. We know nothing. I mean, Kevin Chan, the head of public policy for Facebook, I think was asked by one of the Senate committees, how many moderators does Facebook have in Canada? And he refused, he, first he said, I think he didn't know. And then he, and then he kind of refused to answer it. I think he said, even if I did know, like that's a company, that's our proprietary, whatever, right? And I was just like, dude, <laughs> you know, like, like, if I were in the Canadian government, I would be extremely interested to know who is moderating Facebook with the goal, one would think, of reflecting Canadian cultural standards for what we find acceptable and unacceptable, which, by the way, might be somewhat different from what you think in Silicon Valley, right? Um, and so, like, like, we don't even know those things. Where are the moderators? How many are there here? What are they trained? Are their standards different for Canada than they are for somewhere else? right? Those things aren't known. So there's too much work to be done, right? Like there's a whole lot of work to be done before solutions can be um, like real solutions, right? There's, there, there's a whole lot of learning and iterating and testing and thinking. There's just like a lot of stuff. It's a process, right? I wish, like I wish, I would love to answer the question 
of like queen for the day, what would I do? I would love to answer that question. I would love to be the queen for the day and I would love to know the right answer, but I don't have either of those things. Nobody does, I think. Lost in all of the conversation about harms is any idea that the internet could be useful to us again, right? Um, and I remember back in 1999 when I was at the CBC and I went over to the internet side, I kept waiting for the government to do something similar for the internet as what had been done for radio and television before it and the music industry and the film industry, right? So we had decided back then, in the 60s, the 40s, 1910, I don't know, we had decided that we, we considered ourselves to have a culture that was important to us and we wanted it perpetuated, we wanted it to grow, we wanted it to continue and flourish and continue. And so we did a bunch of things. We did a bunch of policy, like we did CanCon regulations for the radio, right? We created the CBC, we created it, right? Because we wanted to carve out this public space for the people to talk to each other and to hear from each other in the ways that were possible then, right? Um, and so I used to be surprised that we didn't do something similar to the internet. I was like, where is the CBC of the internet? Where is the, like, it was so obvious, right? That we were gonna get a tidal wave of Silicon Valley stuff, right? Um, and we would need to carve out and create space for and fund something different if we wanted something different. So we didn't do it. Now it's too late to do that kind of thing. Like, like Canada, people sometimes have ideas like, Canada could make its own Facebook or whatever. I was once assigned at the CBC to see if I could make a Wikipedia for Canada, <laughs> right? So we sometimes still have those ideas, but those are all non-starters, right? It's a global world. The stuff comes from where it comes from, monopolizing effects, blah, 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 right? Um, but that does not mean that there aren't like really fantastic things that could be done that could be like great for this country like they've been doing some things in Taiwan related to um, voting and 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 policy development with the citizens ways of doing consultation there's software that's very interesting there's processes that are very interesting you think about like I think about what Wikipedia is in relation to journalism because that's the stuff that I know best right so journalism was I guess what you want to know, and then I go and try and get the questions that I think you have answered, right? And then Wikipedia is like, we don't have a gatekeeper. We all put our stuff here and everybody gets everything they want so much better, right? And like, what's the equivalent of that for government, right? Like what would happen? What could be transformative if, if we don't need so much proxying, right? And we don't need so much guessing and we can just like, like open the gates and 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 not have as much gatekeeping. I mean, it would look different. It wouldn't look, it's not the same relationship as journalism and Wikipedia, but you just think, what would it look like if we could engage more, if we could talk, citizens could talk directly to each other so much more easily, right? We don't think about those things anymore. And that is part of why I, I'm keen, like you do the online harm stuff, right? You, you kind of constrain some bad things. And then maybe there's some space where we can start seeing some good headlines again, right? Like people can start up some stuff and they're like, oh, that's interesting. You know, like, like what could that turn into, right? We can't get there until we stop the sewage, I think, right? But, but it would be lovely, right? Like imagine if we could realize some of that original promise, right? Like it would be great.